So I'm going to talk today a little bit about pooling in Erlang. And I'm sort of going to come at this from kind of a newbie perspective, like if you don't know much about it. And so there may be a lot of repetition here, so just bear with me. We'll get to some interesting stuff at the end. Uh, so first off, a little bit about me. I've been working sort of on the web uh, since near the beginning. I uh, started out doing website development in 96. Um, started doing sort of ad serving on the internet around 97, 98. Uh, so that brought this kind of high volume, low latency serving into play. And since 2008, I've been doing this almost ex exclusively in Erlang. Um, I made a few assumptions about the audience, like you guys probably know a little Erlang, you're at an Erlang conference. Uh, you've most likely written a gen server or two. Um, and you're kind of curious about, you know, pooling of resources, in this case, gen servers or processes. A few things about Erlang that sort of come into play here is, you know, Erlang is a concurrent language. It's built around these lightweight processes, sort of shared nothing message passing. And a common pattern that you're going to use in any server is, I'm going to spawn a process uh, for request or action. I'm going to do something with it. Uh, and then I'm going to throw that away. But oftentimes, when you're in that situation, you have certain information that every request needs to get access to uh, state. And you need a way to sort of get at that state. Um, what might this state look like? This state could be configuration. Uh, it could be you know, a large cached file that you're keeping around to serve out really fast. Um, but spin up a new process, it has to get information to it, or at least get a pointer to it, and pass that information along. Uh, you might have a large data structure. Maybe you're building a big search tree in memory, and you don't want to sort of create that every time. So you keep it around and pass some information to search it. Uh, maybe you have persistent connections to a database system or something like that that you're keeping in a process. Um, so what are the options for sharing this state that you might have? Uh, one, you can recreate it every time. You know, maybe it's a really small you know, data structure that you need to search, and you just create it when you create the process. Uh, you can use the built-in sort of sharing structures, at stets, amnesia. Uh, maybe it's big enough you want to stick it into some external database and actually make network calls. Um, you can also just like, all right, I'm going to put it in a process, and then if it's in a process, this means I can do things like send a message to that process to get the state, send a message to the process to sort of set the state if I'm allowing that, um, send some parameters to a process, combine it with the state in that process and com compute something. Uh, you can, as I said before, keep a connection in that process. This is a very common pattern you see, like here's a process, it's got a connection to a database. I send some information over to the process, the process then makes the call to the database formulates the response and sends it back. So I went through and made you know, some very simple you know, template gen servers that kind of do this. Uh, in this first one, you know, we uh, have the standard get state call that has, you know, is doing a gen server call. In our initialization function, we'd be getting the state from someplace. And in our handler call, we'd be sort of taking the state, passing it back. Um, maybe we're doing some work. In this case, maybe we're generating some large search tree data structure and our search call is going to send some parameters over. Your handle call is going to sort of do a search uh, using those parameters in your tree and respond with the answer. Um, another, one more final example, this is kind of like, okay, the database connection or connection to somewhere example. In your initialization function, you're gonna connect to some place. Um, when you call the get data function, gen server call for get data, given a query, you send it across the connection, you get the answer back, and you send it out. So, you know, this, this looks great, right? But, but sort of what's the drawback of that pattern? Uh, the one thing that I sort of neglected to mention is that all of these are, you know, declared to basically be uh, in the registry as the name of this module. So you can just call the, you know, stuff module and, you know, get it. This is great, but Back to that concurrency thing, well, this means that we, you know, the processes are modeled as you have a, you have a um, process mailbox was a, essentially a queue for the most part. Um, you know, we won't talk about select or receive, but for the most part, it's just a serialized set of requests. It's going through, pulling them out, looking at them. Um, and it's theoretically unlimited in length. So you can keep piling stuff into it uh, and not dealing with it, and your queue gets really backed up, and then, you know, the Linux OM killer kills your VM, and then you're like, what just happened? Um, and then inevitably you go back and it was logging. But, uh, <laughs> and there's only sort of limited support in the VM for any sort of back pressure. 
Um, and it's not really well documented as far as I've seen. I've only seen it on a few message board posts and things where it's like, oh, if your queue is backed up, it'll bump the reduction counter of the caller. Um, or I believe I may have heard that in Lucas's scheduler discussion or something like that at one point. Um, but I'm not exactly how, sure how well that works if you're in, say, a you know, gen server call where you're waiting for something. It's like bumping the reductions of the caller. I don't, I don't know how that has any impact. Um, so, you know, these concurrency is good, but there are these sort of limitations. And this still works, right? But what it, you know, these, having a single process do that, but it doesn't really scale across cores. And so immediately what you find is if you have this and you have a lot of people calling it, you got one core that's super, super busy and the rest of them are doing nothing. Uh, and usually if you're coming to Erlang from some other language, you look to sort of what you used in the past to do these sorts of things, which was, oh, well, I would just use a thread pool or something like that. Um, so, you know, what would I, what would this be in, in Erlang? Well, maybe it's a process pool or, you know, maybe a resource or worker pool or connection pool. Hmm, I wonder how I'd figure that out. So, you know, I did what I figured most people would do and I went to GitHub and did some searches. So I searched for these and then sort of limited by Erlang as the language. And I was like, oh, okay, 12 results for process pool. Oh, that's cool. Another three for resource and there's not many of those. All right, 18 for worker. Oh, and 19 for connection pool, like, wow, that's like, and then I look through them, and I'm like, oh, but I know of at least seven other libraries that do something of this form that are not even in this list. So I was like, all right, these are 59 libraries I found just on GitHub, and of those searches, there was only one library that was listed in multiple results. So it's, it was sort of like, but all the libraries kind of could do most of these things or would fall under these categories. So I'm like, well, all right, that's kind of interesting, one library and it's not even the one I would expect is not listed in any of these. So I decided, okay, well, what, if I didn't know much, you know, how would I go about sort of figuring out how to kind of whittle this down to a short set? Uh, so first I went through each project and I sort of decided to, say, to figure out, is this project active? Like when was its last commit? Sort of when was it created? When was its last commit? Like is there code there? Um, are there, you know, recent open issues or more telling, are there issues that were open three years ago and are still sitting in the GitHub issues queue? Um, and the next thing I looked at is, well, is this really a standalone sort of general purpose pooling library or is this some sort of pool plus database library, which a significant amount of them actually are. Um, so that kind of helped sort of, you know, get rid of say two thirds of them. Because uh, it's all like, oh, this is pool boy plus, you know, R serve. This is pool boy plus, you know, Postgres, this pool plus pool boy plus React C or Pooler plus React C or Hot Tub plus React C. I think there was many of them. Um, the other thing I, I looked at as I said, well, if I'm going to sort of play around with these, I want to make sure that like if I decide to use them, they're sort of ready for use. So two things I sort of look for when I'm looking at, at open source libraries and deciding if they're ready for use is one, do they tag releases? Are there tags in their GitHub repo that have versions in them? Because you know what, if you just have a master branch it's all but useless to me. Uh, you know, it pretty much means I'm gonna have to basically like look at the exact commit and use that and make up a version and use that because the main thing you want is reproducibility in these things and if you are all, always pulling from master then when your coworker pulls from it two days later, he might have some different library he's using. Um, and then I tried to actually just sort of like, okay, I'll include these in rebar and just see if I can just pull and build the depths. Um, and I actually found a couple where even though they were themselves built with rebar, they used some plugins or these some other things and just would not build themselves as a rebar dependency. And even though they were interesting, I just dropped them because I was like, well, you know, they, I can't just get them to build by including them as a dependency. So they're, they're probably not worth sort of more time. Um, and this brought me down to, you know, a, a short list of which I whittled it down to, to five. Um, and, you know, several of these you probably know, Pool, Pool Boy and Pooler probably, because these are, you know, they were the top of the list on several of them, on at least the two. They weren't on the same list, but they were the top of the list on two different ones. Um, Pool Boy seemed by far the most popular just because it was included and used in many other uh, of the other libraries further down the list. Um, Pooler I called by, the mo by far the most OTP because it's just, and we'll get into it later, just structurally it's, it's as OTP as you can get, and it was part of the building of it, I guess. Like, how can we like be as o OTP as possible? Um, I included one that we sort of wrote at OpenX, um, sort of around the same time Poolboy was being written and have used in, for years, mostly because I knew it. 
um, and also because it does things slightly differently in, in a sort of interesting way. Um, I included one uh, that Fred had talked about a few years ago called Dispcount, um, just because I thought that its sort of dispatch method, method was interesting and I had actually played with it enough to kind of be familiar with it. Um, and then GProc actually comes with a module called GProc Pool, which does uh, a lot of the things that these pooling mechanisms do, uh, short of actually managing the processes, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, I found a few others that were interesting, but ended up having some problems. Uh, one that I, that I thought was interesting mostly because of the, the text on it is it, LeoPod is, I guess, part of LeoFS, which is some sort of distributed database written in Erlang. I don't know too much about it. Um, but in the first comment, they said, we used to use ETS, but we stopped because it didn't work on large systems. And I was like, hmm, that's the first time I've ever heard someone say that they were using ETS and then switched away from using ETS. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have time to really sort of dig in there, and their, their implementation wasn't interesting other than that. It seemed kind of the, the same as one of the others. Um, my sort of theory is that they probably did some testing back in the R15 days. Uh, when there were still some issues with ETS on like, you know, more than 16 cores and, you know, we ran into these, you run it on something with 24 cores and suddenly performance is like really weird and you don't know why. Uh, and then the, you know, reader group locking things got added and uh, they got faster again. Uh, another one that I found in the, the, the bachelor repos was side job, um, which is, is sort of a pool and sort of not. Uh, mostly it's a sort of, it was interesting in that it seemed to dispatch work based on scheduler locality. Uh, and I actually sort of played around with this at one point and, found, and sort of abandoned it because it, it got to be too clumpy because of this, this, you know, focus on staying local when spawning up workers. Um, PQ was interesting because it sort of used, was one of the few that actually used a gen FSM in its sort of dispatch logic. Most others were just kind of straight gen server. This actually seemed to use a FSM, and I was like, oh, that's cool. Um, but I think this was one that it was like, I don't know, it failed to, to import with rebar and build or something like that. Um, Epishina, I think is how that's pronounced, was a really interesting sort of connection pooling thing. Um, but this, again, sort of failed to compile as a rebar dependency. Um, I also looked at worker pool from Anaka, because uh, it had some blog posts and seemed to have been used in production, but I couldn't find any tagged releases of it. So I sort of you know, decided not to use that one either. Um, so then after looking at the ones that I sort of decided on, I, I found that these, these things all had sort of two things in common. Um, you know, these common components. They all consist of some sort of worker pool, some sort of like set of processes uh, that are supervised and, and, and are monitored. And these are the things that you're distributing your work to. And then they have what I'm calling dispatching, uh, which is some strategy for selecting one of the workers out of the pool and giving it work. Um, I then sort of looked at those and found many features which you can sort of use to differentiate, and hopefully the size looks okay. Um, first of all was ease of use. I basically said, all right, how, how much does it take to sort of, you know, integrate with this library? Um, and then there's various features of the worker pool that I found that, that sort of were distinguishing features. Uh, one was, you know, can you have variable size in the worker pool? Uh, can you specify a min and a max? Um, does it have that? Uh, the other one is sort of auto, what I'm calling auto sizing. Like, can the pool sort of grow and shrink over time? Uh, and there's a couple ways that, that I saw it done. Sometimes it's based on sort of the age of the worker. Other times it might be based on the idleness of the worker. Uh, and the idea with these is you set a minimum, you set a max, you say, oh, they're going to live at most this amount. And then you sort of vary between the min and max, and they sort of die off if they've been alive for more than that amount. And idle sort of works the same way, except that it sort of sees like, well, if this one hasn't done any work in a while, it kills it off. Uh, and then there's sort of the, the few features of, of dispatching, one of which is the sort of method of dispatching. Uh, most of them use a sort of check-in, check-out type method. Um, a couple of them use more like a, a random method or round robin, a few others uh, in there. And then in the process of dispatching, there's sort of two ways that they can sort of uh, dispatch work, one of which is they can dispatch with an internal queue, uh, which queues up work if workers are all busy, um, and the other is a sort of fail-fast mechanism where if there's no workers available, it just fails immediately. Uh, and then I, was, I tried to sort of measure performance with some sort of simple benchmarking. Uh, so next I'm going to kind of get into sort of the details of sort of how I tested around and played with these libraries, and I'll have a link at the end, all the codes on GitHub, you can go and play with them yourself if you want to. 
So the first thing is I kind of created my like, sort of example worker. Um, very simple gen server. He just has this one function do. Uh, I removed all of the sort of like, you know, registration of it. So the start link just kind of returns, it's gonna return a PID. Um, the do function is gonna take that PID, call the work function with a couple parameters, and that's gonna call like, you know, itself a work function in the call. Uh, and then I decided to, if I was gonna do comparisons, I would need to do, well, what's the most common of those, you know, different features that all of them sort of support? Uh, so fixed size, because not all of them supported variable sizing. And also they all seem to support uh, fail fast semantics. And you know, some of them also support queuing, but they all did fail fast. Um, so first to take a sort of deeper dive into Poolboy. Um, as I said before, this was kind of the most popular based on just its use in other projects. Uh, in terms of code, it was, it's very small. You know, it's sort of like 306 lines of code, 670 lines of tests. That's it's by far the smallest of all the ones looked at. Um, it can both queue and fail fast, and the queue can sort of be, you know, or fail fast, and the queue can sort of be a LIFO FIFO. So you can kind of like, as things work gets queued up, you can either have the most recent one worked on first or the, the oldest one. Um, it has very limited support for variable sizing and auto sizing. Essentially, you set a fixed size, and then you can set an overflow amount, and it will overflow up to that amount, but if you're in overflowed process, it'll immediately be killed after it does its work. Um, so uh, I kind of question how well that would work through you know, a semi-sustained spike, because it seems like you'd be constantly spinning up new processes to deal with it, and then they'd immediately be killed. Um, and it can pretty much store any PID. Essentially, its only requirement is that whatever thing you're storing in, it has a start leak function that returns a, a PID. So you could use it to store supervisors or GenFSMs or anything like that. Um, actually writing code to sort of integrate with it, uh, somewhere you'll be sort of creating uh, in your supervision tree, usually, uh, something like this that basically is creating a pool boy pool. Uh, you give it a name. Uh, you tell it what the worker module is. You specify the size, which in this play case I'm specifying it as my maximum size. And then I'm setting the overflow to zero because in this case I want to keep it fixed size. Uh, when you actually go to sort of do work with it, you're going to have to sort of check it out. Uh, that's either going to give you full if you've used up all your workers because we're in fail fast mode, at which point I kind of convert that to error busy. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to get back essentially a PID so I can call my worker to actually do my work and then I sort of check it in and return the result here. Um, I decided to kind of take a look at the details of what happens during these calls. Uh, and I'm using a, a color here to sort of uh, denote anything that kind of ends up being a, a process to process call is either gonna be sort of like blue or red. And those that are in red are ones that I feel could kind of contend if you have a lot of processes and doing them at once. So in this case, when you call Poolboy from your caller, it's going to check out, which is a gen server call. Uh, and pretty much any caller is all going to be calling that same gen server with that same call. So I put this in red to say it sort of contends. And you'll see this in, in subsequent slides so you can get a sense of how they compare. Uh, it decides if there's a worker available. If not, hey, it's full. If there is, here's the PID. Uh, you then have a PID where you can call and do work. Uh, and since it's been checked out of the pool, you know, you're the only one calling that one, so that's one's in blue. You get back your result, and then you do a cast to check things in. All right, moving along to uh, Pooler. Uh, so Pooler has, as I said, a very sort of complicated supervision tree, where it's like supervisors of supervisors of, you know, groups and all sorts of things, and it, it's, it's pretty large compared to, to, to Poolboy. It's 841 lines of code, 1,000 lines of tests, it is unique in that it supports sort of groups of pools using uh, PG2, uh, which is something that the others don't. Uh, it can both queue and fail fast. Uh, it does support variable sizing and sort of auto sizing based on age. Um, the culling is a little bit noisy, so when it actually kills off a process, it actually uses OTP logging, so you get a big SASL message. And I tend to not like that when my pool is like every few minutes when something dies goes, hey, something just died. Uh, and it can pretty much store any sort of PID. Um, Similar to Poolboy, in this case, you know, you can sort of tie it directly into your tree and have some stuff done using system parameters, but I wanted to have them all work in a similar fashion, so I kind of had to create a gen server just to call this one function to create the new pool. Um, but again, you can give it a sort of maximum count and an initial count. In these cases, I just made them both the max, 
It's got a max age in there, and since it was so noisy, I just set the max age really high. So it's, that's there mostly just to kind of see that, that, that it's there. The, uh, the do function ends up looking you know, pretty much the same, just kind of the function names and the return codes are different. In this case, you're taking a member and getting back no members and, you know, but you, and then returning the member afterwards. Uh, and actually, the call details actually look almost identical. Uh, when you take a member, you call this one you know, gen server that's managing it, and it checks to see if there's a member. It says no. It says yes, you get a PID. You can call your server. You can get the result. Uh, there you go. Uh, the next one is a gen server pool. And uh, this one is kind of unique in that it, it, it sort of masquerades as the worker, uh, in that you don't really explicitly do any check-ins or checkouts. And I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, it's medium size, 470 lines of code. Zero lines of test code, though. I'm not going to apologize for that. Just have to say that, you know, we just test our code in production, that's all. Uh, it has been running, you know, in production for at least four and a half years or something. So, so it, it does work, but it does have its problems, as we'll get into in a minute. Um, it can queue or fill fast, um, or actually, it can do both, because you can actually set a limited queue size. So it'll queue up to a certain number and then fail fast after that. Um, it supports variable sizing. Um, and auto sizing based on either age or idle. Uh, and then it's really geared towards just gen servers only. Um, and, and the reason why is because it actually never spawns the gen server that you give it. It just embeds that in another gen server and proxies all the calls to it. Um, configuration is very, is very similar uh, to before. And it was, the idea was that wherever you had your gen server link, you could just replace it with a gen server pool start link and throw in some extra options, and it would just work. Uh, so you can specify in your options, you know, min pool size, max, your idle timeout, max age. I'm specifying to not queue here. Um, and uh, in the do function, as you notice, unlike the others, this one actually just calls the baseline worker directly with the pool ID, right? So I didn't actually. I technically don't have to change that um, unless I actually want to see if the, you know, that I got a request dropped. Um, so if you're actually queuing things and doing that, like you don't have to change anything. You just kind of like change where you do your start link and suddenly you've got a pool of gen servers where you had one before. Um, now the call graph looks a little different in this case. Uh, you know, when you make, you know, your caller is actually calling your worker, but I sort of say, well, in, in truth, you're calling your gen server pool. Um, but you're calling a gen server call or cast or info of your worker, and it's just getting picked up by the pool. The pool is seeing if it has a proxy available. Um, if it doesn't, it's returning, saying, no, I don't have one, so I'm dropping your request. If it does, it sort of gets a proxy out of its internal thing. It then calls the proxy. Uh, the proxy itself is a gen server that just contains your worker as a, you know, a as it contains the atom name of your worker as a function or as a, a parameter, and it just calls you know m colon handle call directly in the code, and just forwards the call along and gets the result out, and will do sort of check in and check out right at that point. So you never actually see any of the check in check out, um, because essentially it'll get back a response and then it'll check it in if it can, and then it'll sort of forward the result back out. Um, and this is a uh, you know, it works well. Uh, the main issue with it uh, has been that in some servers where you actually have to send a bit of data uh, to your worker, you end up actually copying the data through a couple different places. And the, the gen server pool sort of dispatch process can get really backed up. Um, the next is disp count, uh, which I found was unique uh, back when I heard about it, because it's got this sto sto stochastic based selection. And it can either use ETS tables or name processes, and that it sort of just randomly selects a resource, tries to see if it can use it. If it can't, it fails. If it can, it goes, goes ahead and does it. Uh, again, this is pr very small. It's like you know, 297 lines of code, 361 lines of tests. Uh, it's fail fast only. Like Basically, it'll sort of randomly pick a, a resource. If you get it, you get it. If not, like you're done. Um, and this means that you, it's up to you to sort of decide, do I want to retry? Um, I mean, I've done things in the past where I just call Erlang yield and retry again, do this a few times. If it, you know, eventually you get a resource or you give up after you know, 10 tries. Uh, it only supports a fixed number of resources. Um, but this can store sort of any sort of resource. And actually, the storing of a PID um, ended, up ended up resulting in you sort of going through a couple of hops. Um, using discount, 
uh, you need to sort of start a, dis, uh, a dispatcher. And again, I ended up sort of, sort of wrapping this in a gen server in order just to, to call this the start function. Uh, and you give it the sort of, as your resources, your max pool size. Um, it requires that you have this info that you pass whenever you check something out. Uh, and all of the processes that are checking it out sort of need this information. And kind of the most efficient way I, I found of doing this is kind of just to throw it in a Mochi Global. So when I create it, I stick it in this Mochi Global. And then later on, when I'm going to call it, I get it back out of Mochi Global. And then, you know, checkout check in is very similar, right? And check something out, um, you get that it's busy. When you go to check something, uh, in, you have to include essentially the reference that it gives you. So you can do your work and then check it back in afterwards. Um, however, it also requires that you implement a behavior. And this behavior is actually what's sort of managing the resource itself. Uh, so in this case, in the behavior in the initialization function, I actually start up the worker uh, and I keep track of its PID as well as the arguments it was started with. Um, when you check out, uh, you only check out things um, well, if you try to check out something that's already been checked out, it'll actually come back as busy. Uh, if not, it'll basically say that I'm using it and return the PID in the checkout function, and then the check-in sort of does the reverse. Uh, and since things can die, in this case, when they die, it just restarts them, and that's why you keep around the initial arguments. Uh, but this itself is running inside of a, a, a process, so you end up with a process that sort of contains a reference to another process. And so when you're calling, you kind of have to hop um, the call graph for discount uh, is nice because it's pretty much all blue. You know, there's, there's no real places where things actually like call, multiple processes are all calling into the same gen server. On um, checkout, it sort of checks its internal lock table to get a lock. If it doesn't get it, it's busy. If it, uh, if it does get it, it sort of grabs a dispatcher um, and it does that through an internal uh, server. Um, it then sort of calls that dispatcher module which is going to return the PID, and then you know you call the worker across there, it comes back, uh, and then you do the check-in, and that ends up being another cast, uh, and you eventually give up the lock. Uh, so the final one I'm going to go into is uh, GProc, and what I'm really talking about here is sort of GProc pool. Um, this offers just the sort of dispatching method. It's just the hey, how do I select one of the processes in the pool, uh, and then it assumes that you're using GProc for the managing of those processes. Um, GProc pool itself is relatively small. It's 558 lines of code and 98 lines of test. But GProc itself, which you pretty much have to include, is you know, it's Excel, as I call it. 4,000 lines of code, 1,800 lines of test. It's a lot in there. Um, it does support sort of active queuing in that internally it actually will do the sort of like yield and try again uh, up to some, some amount of time. Or it does fail fast. Uh, it does not support sizing because essentially it, it just defers that to you. So you can kind of decide to do it. Um, it stores really PIDs only. Uh, the dispatch is purely ETS based in that it's just using the GProc tables. There's sort of no gen servers involved. Um, and it, it does, it, uh, it, but it does require your worker to be modified. Um, and I'll show that in a minute. So setting it up, you have to, uh, you know, call this GProc pool new and you give it sort of a strategy. In this case, the claim strategy is the, is the closest to the check in, check out strategy. So since I was going for what's most common, that is the most common in this case. Uh, and then I just construct a, a fixed uh, number of workers, um, just because that's the easiest. And for each worker, you need to call this GProc pool add worker, um, give it the pool ID, and then sort of give it the name. Um, and the name in this case, I give it the, I, the pool ID and then a number. Uh, and then I have to actually pass that name and that ID to the uh, worker itself. Uh, and then when you actually go to sort of do something with it, you claim and you actually pass it a function. And the function is going to get back uh, two pieces of information. I forget what the first one was, but it wasn't useful. The second one is actually the PID. So at that point, I can actually kind of call the, uh, in this case, the GProc worker, which is my different from the baseline worker. Um, and I'll either get back false if it was busy or true in the result if I get back a result. So the one difference that you have to make to your worker is you actually have to sort of connect the worker to the uh, pool. And what it's actually doing here is it's actually getting the PID of the worker and then associating that with the ID in GProc that you're using so you can actually do the lookup. Um, now, when you're calling GProc and you go to claim something, like it's pretty much just using the GProc ETS table and it's doing like a ETS select. So it kind of just finds one of these. Um, if it doesn't find one, it returns false. If it does, it sort of grabs that 
the pit out um, and it's making a, a second sort of ETS call to get that. And then it can sort of use that to pass it off to the worker, um, get back the result, and it can sort of clear the lock in the first table and then sort of pass back the result. Um, so I kind of have, had implemented all of these and I wanted to do just like a little bit of comparative analysis. Um, so I wrote a, a very simple benchmarking thing. Um, and as I mentioned before, in order to do this, I kind of picked the most sort of common setting. Um, so I did a fixed pool size of just like 20 processes. I'm like running this on a laptop. Um, I did the fast fail config. And then I would just spawn differing number of callers uh, up to and then past the pool size. Because I really wanted to see sort of how they started to behave when they were sort of being overdriven. Uh, and each of the little uh, callers sort of gets a worker, does a work, in this case, just sleeping a little bit. Um, it then sort of waits a little bit of amount of time before it sort of does some more work. And then it repeats for some number of iterations. And that's just so that I could have like, OK, I'm going to have a, you know, 50 worker, 50 callers all just like making calls. And they each make 1,000. Um, and then I just sort of measured a few different things. And we can kind of go through um, the results real quick. Uh, so the first thing I looked at is like, OK, what's good versus busy results? Um, and already we start to see some, some differentiation here in that most of those that, uh, that are not discount, they actually you know, give you good results. Um, and they all, everything is good up to, up to a certain point. That pool size, at the pool size, they start to diverge and then sort of give differing numbers of results. Uh, discount, since it's possible, even with uh, low traffic to look up a random number and conflict means that you immediately get busy signal even at the beginning. Um, and if we look at the busy results, we kind of see the, the sort of inverse of that graph in that it's like, yep, most of them are zero except for discount, and then they sort of all sort of go up. Um, I also looked at sort of timing, like how much time are these taking? And remember, most of these are just sleep times, but it's sort of like, it's what I imagine, like it's pretty flat, the minimum time, up until the pool size at which they start to just drop, because when you're in overload, most things are just the minimum time is zero, because everything is failing fast. Uh, and I did notice that Pooler, for some reason, in a lot of cases, like, never fully dropped to zero like everything else. Like, I ran this many times, and this one actually is the only one that didn't show it actually non-zero across the board. So um, I didn't know what to make of that. Uh, the average time, you know, kind of what you'd expect. It's like flat, uh, except for, you know, discount, because it's failing, or it's giving busy snickles half the time, so those are going to be faster. And then it starts to sort of drop off after that. Uh, and the max times are kind of flat, but sort of much higher. Um, I also looked at sort of uh, global context switches. Um, and this is mostly just to kind of look at them, comparing them next to each other. Uh, and it's kind of what you would, would expect, where the ones that are sort of ETS-based, which are not actually switching between processes as much, actually stay sort of near the bottom. Um, and it's interesting, though, that some of these kind of really flatten out. And these, these graphs, even though I ran it over and over and over again, they kind of all looked very much the same. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'm not sure like why Pool Boy can flatten out at some point. And I'm sure it all comes down to the exact number of like, you know, operations done and, and whatnot. Uh, reductions also kind of show this uh, in that as things fail more, they actually sort of do less. So the reductions kind of go up, and then they sort of all just fall off. Um, and what I really wanted to try to get at, and which I'm going to bring up on the next slide, even though it doesn't really show what I, I saw, is uh, mostly came about in our use of GenServer. And when we were in overload, I would connect to a node and run NTOP, and I could watch this one process, that dispatch process, and I could watch it spike to like 100 messages, zero messages, 100 messages, zero messages. And I'd watch CPU like spiking and sort of doing that. And I was like, well, is there a way for me to measure that? Um, and the best I came up with is I spin up a little gen server that sits there and like every couple of milliseconds will just like run through all the message queues and take the maximum of all of them. And then I just, after the run, I just take what was the maximum during that run. And I decided to graph it just to kind of see what it looked like. Um, and this was all over the place. So every one of them looked different. So I'm like, oh, there has to be a better way to go about doing it. If anyone has ideas, I'd love to hear them. But uh, sort of looked like this um, in that, uh, you know, down here at the bottom, we've got GProc and Discount, which stay pretty flat, which is what you'd expect because they don't use a lot of uh, they don't use a lot of Gen servers, so there's not a lot of queue buildup. Um, whereas all the others, which have sort of one Gen server, uh, you do see these like this like intermittent random sort of spikiness. Uh, so given all this, 
you know, I sort of came up with kind of like general recommendations on when you might want to use one of these. Um, you know, Pool Boy, it's very popular. It's very small and easy to understand. Uh, lots of people use it, so probably lots of people could help if you ever have issues. Um, it may have issues with load, but probably like not awful issues. You know, I mean, uh, in s short tests of overdriving it, it was fine. Um, and only if you're in the you know insane world of every you know bit of time counts, then you might want to not 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 choose it. Uh, Pooler is close second. It also seems you know uh, used by other other projects and and you know well maintained and whatnot. Um, but the fact that it is just so OTP made it just kind of like difficult to work with um, because it was hard to sort of like tease it out and put it just into your supervision tree. And it's like so many like lines of code and does so much extra stuff to deal with like groups of groups and integrating with PG and all that. I was like, well, in most cases, I, I don't know if I'd need to use it. Um, GenServer Pool, like I said, it's kind of really easy like to integrate with. Uh, but you know, it's only really been used at OpenX. Um, we haven't documented it well. Uh, so you know, what you see in these slides are probably the best documentation that exists at the moment. Uh, if you want to play with it, you know, yeah, feel free. We, like I said, we've used it a lot. Um, discount is great for the reasons stated on its GitHub page. Like, if you know you're going to be overdriving a limited number of things and that, you can, and that failure is fine, it's going to be the fastest one that you'll find out there. Um, and then GProc like, seems that it should actually also be really good at this because it's really just using ETS. I mean, it doesn't even really have any gen servers that it get interacted with on that dispatch stage. Uh, but it does require that you sort of do a little bit of work to write your own sort of process management. So if you want to grow and shrink pools or you want to do all that, you kind of have to do that all yourself. Um, and it does require you to sort of change kind of existing workers. Um, given all this, are there times when you actually don't want to pool? Um, and, and I think there are. You know, I mentioned a lot of cases where you do, like, oh, I have a giant data structure that I need to keep around in memory, and spawning them and creating any of them is expensive, so I want a, a limited number, or I have some connections to a database or something like that. Uh, but single gen, gen servers can really almost sometimes never become bottlenecks. If you're sending them a tiny amount of data and they're doing a tiny amount of stuff, like, they never really, you know, even if everyone's calling them at once, they really, you, you, can, you can have some of them that you just never notice. Um, if you have a large fixed data structure that you're going to search, uh, but it's pretty much like fixed and that you don't change it a lot, you can just compile that ahead of time and just embed it directly in the calls that it's being used in. Uh, and I've used this a lot, uh, just you know, using say CT expand or something like that, or even just generating Erlang code with Perl. Uh, you can do it, and you can get really big data structures, and they're you know compiled, and it takes a bit of a bit of time to compile them, and they end up being enormous. But you know, I've had a a module that had a function that had 100,000 heads, and it worked great. Uh, another is it sort of passing around ports. So this goes back to the kind of connection pooling thing. There's a pattern that is like, oh, you wrap a process around your connection, and you just keep those processes around. You want to make calls to the connection. You send it to there, and it sends it across the port. Uh, this can be a little bit of an anti-pattern if essentially you're constructing, say, like a large I.O. list, and then sending it across a process boundary to something else, which is then sending it to the port, because what you're going to do is make a copy of that entire thing, which is probably going to make that process actually like grow and possibly go through multiple GCs and things like that. So I actually had a lot of um, success with just essentially having a small gen server that just kept a queue of ports around, pulled ports out, used them, put them back into that. Uh, and considering there's also a lot of servers and things already have ways to kind of reuse acceptors and things like that, I, I assume there would be interesting ways you could kind of like keep a connection open for all the uses of the same acceptor and therefore not actually have processes involved at all. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, the example code plus all the notes and the, and the, pro and the uh, presentation are all uh, in this repo. Uh, my contact info is, is, is here. I wanted to thank OpenX for sort of giving me the time to sort of do the, the research and write the talk up. And uh, if you, you know, Anyone is not currently doing Erlang every day and, and is interested in uh, what we do at OpenX and what we do with Erlang at OpenX, please come talk to me. Thank you, guys. And I know we're right at time, but if you have questions, I'll take them.
Well, basically, the way that I've always done that, um, because essentially it's really hard to reproduce your production system, especially when it's that scale, is uh, essentially canary-based testing. So you make a modified server that uses a different pooler, pooling library, and you replace one of your servers with it, and then compare to one of your servers that doesn't have it. And you know that that works if your business can support possible failures of a portion of your of your your, your stuff. Um, and you know, I'm lucky enough that we can do that. Uh, and so a lot of testing uh, on production side of things was done using that. The testing I did here was really just like, oh, I just want to kind of get some baseline comparative sort of stuff. Uh, you could fork it and try to like crank up the numbers and see if you could get it to, to do stuff. But I have a feeling that it's like, you're not going to get a realistic test unless you just like kind of rip out the code um, now, what this might give you is like I kind of show you an easy way to do all the different ones, and the code has sort of complete examples, so you could kind of just like do that to make the check-in and check-out as as similar as possible. Yeah, I, I, had, I thought I had a slide, but I must have maybe went through it real quick. Uh, the main reason usually ends up being if, if, the, if the process creation is expensive in some way. No, 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 not, 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 not just not spawning a process. Spawning a process is cheap, but when I talk about creation, it's really the creation of the state that that process is managing. Okay. Okay. So, you know, the standard model of Erlang is like if you need state that a lot of people need to get at, you kind of need to keep it somewhere in a process because that's how it keeps around state. Or you know, if you can model as an ETS or something like that, that's great. But say you build a you know, enormous you know, GB tree that you're using for search, right? And it takes you like 30 seconds to like build that up. Well, you don't want to every time you have to handle that request generate one of those. And you know we have this in our business of serving ads and that we have a really large search tree, which is sort of all the advertisements that we need to consider. And they each have rules associated with them. And we need to go through that list and apply rules and figure out which ones match and don't. And it's this giant data structure. And it takes a good 20, 30 seconds to spin up. So we want to have a sort of a limited size of them. And we tend to you know, know that, like, OK, the number of cores in the system is going to limit us. So we will use the pooling up to the core size. Uh, but it's really about like, oh, I need to have some number of them. Now, in some cases, you might actually oversubscribe uh, because some things might be, say, a connection to a database that is somewhat expensive to, to build up or a connection to a persistent backend that could be expensive to build up. And in those cases, like, you can oversubscribe because most of the time they're spent sort of waiting on network. Um, but you still want to have, say, a limited number of them. And so those are really the cases where, I, where sort of you sort of uh, reach for pooling, like yeah, if it's really cheap to spin them up and you can do it, that's great. Um, so if all members of this pool have the same state, you have a higher process of state scale, right? Uh, yes. Okay, I'll, I'll get, get a reaction to the Why? <laughs> well, because sort of getting the state out of some other place is expensive. Like they're if all the same, right? yeah, they're all the same. So, but I want to I want to run I want to run this uh, a query, like if the things in my state are a collection of rules, and I it's the same set of rules, but I want to basically have multiple callers being uh, having rules run at the same time. Like, I can store those rules in say an ETS table, and then I need to incur the cost of copying them all out of the ETS table before I can service it. Um, but storing them in the state of the process, they're kind of already there. Now, like I mentioned, like an ideal case could be like if your rules are fixed, like precompiling them into a module is going to be the fastest because that's going to be shared by everyone. But again, that's the same thing. It's like you're sharing that, um, or you know, read-only copy of it. But we have actually like rules coming and going all the time, 
So that state actually like, you know, ch mutates and changes. Uh, and even, you know, they should all be the same, but they can vary even by minor amounts throughout time. So hopefully those answer those questions. I don't know who is next. I think he was next. No, no, I, I haven't, I, you know, it, it's hard, even the, the amount of work in this was like multiple weeks of just like every day sitting down and just like messing with these things and reading through code and doing stuff and it sort of became very apparent with the number, that vast number out there that like there was a limited amount of stuff I could do. Because uh, I also didn't really like the way the benchmarking I did really was because it's kind of a super simple benchmark. Um, and I was like, well, it'd be cool to do something like Basho Bench, but I don't know how to use it, and I don't have time to like learn it in the next like week to do stuff, right? So um, I think that there's like more that could be done. It would be interesting to sort of like add more things in here and make the testing a little better and and be able to do that. Uh, and hopefully, I provided since I provided all the code and all the all the benchmark stuff and how I generate all the graphs and the sequence diagrams. It's like all in the in the repo, so um, people can go and you know check it out and. You know, fork it and add different pool or pool things or other ones they find and things like that. So, did you create a big fab nowadays if you have a pool big back pressure? So, did you find any uh, footprint of that in the airline world? Um, the only most of the ones that I found like back pressure was I'll just fail fast and then let the caller sort of deal with with that um, or. I'll queue it and then keep it around for a long time until the you know caller gives up, right? Like they, they think that Pooler has like a timeout based queuing, so you can queue up to a certain timeout. Uh, I know the Gen Server Pool will support sort of timeout on the calls, but I also think it might be a little broken. Um, and uh, so, but nothing that sort of actively sort of combines. Like I don't know if you saw the talk on Jobs. Um, before this in the other room, but Jobs is one that actually is really trying to do that, right? It's like sits in front of your things and basically does similar stuff like, oh, I'm using too many things, I'm just going to sort of fail out really quick. Uh, because some part of it is help the client, okay, let me know who you are, I'll let you know when I'm available for you, and things of that nature. Right, and most of that is deferred to like the application layer because it tends to be very specific, right? Like if you're writing a web app that's doing it like, what do you do? You have to actually design. I mean, in your case, it wouldn't be applicable. Yeah. Um, but I didn't see any of the ones I looked at that really had anything like that. I mean, I assume you could do it with maybe some callback functions or something like that, um, but nothing that was that claimed in the documentation that it did that or anything like that. But then there were so many of them, and it was just going through them. A brief amount was took a long time. Like, there could be something I missed. And I only looked on GitHub. So, like, I, there was a couple I think that I found, I mean, I think I found one that was not on GitHub because I found it on like Trap Exit or you know, whatever, Erlang Central or whatever the new Trap Exit is. So. One more question. Is there any difference in how these different pool libraries handle failure of the process that has currently checked out a resource? Uh, yes. And I didn't go into that too much, but yeah, some of them will monitor the calling process. I think Pooler monitor, monitors the calling process. Uh, other ones basically just, you know, um, if it never gets checked back in, I think they, I mean, it's watching the process that's being checked out. They monitor that. So if the, if the calling process dies, I'm not exactly sure what happens in some of them. So. Well, the supervisor restarts the, he's talking about the caller dying. So you check out a resource, and then you're doing something with it, and then you die. How, do you, how does it get checked back in? Um, and some of them you know, will actually have like a, most of them are like, they wrap things in try catches and then do some things like that to do it. Uh, so that's more deferring to the client. I haven't seen anything that does it, does, it wasn't a common feature that I saw on a lot of them. But I think I saw it on Pooler, maybe. I think that one might have been like, it'll supervise your process, and if it's short-lived, it'll automatically check the resource back in. Um, but most of the others just kind of assume, like, nope, you're going to get it, and you're going to work. And you just wrap your stuff in a try-catch and you know, trap exit or whatever, and then make sure that things work out. <laughs>